Hey everyone, Reese here, and welcome to another episode of WCL Pure One Ocean, where we're catching up with the the people around the world who are all working to protect Big Blue. This week for our series on Plastic Free July, we're chatting with DeRay Shin, who is a young leader for environmental change in Hawaii. Um, officially, DeRay works with Surfrider Foundation Oahu, but uh, her impact extends well beyond that. Uh, she helped lead her university to ban styrofoam at U Hawaii. She managed Kakua Hawaii Foundation's uh, Plastic Free Hawaii program for years. She is a founder of the Good Food Movement and is a strong proponent of local civic engagement on Bill 40 and a number of other issues. She's rad. We had a great catch up and I love her approach to just getting things done. She just goes for it. Um, a quick note though, that there was some background noise and maybe even a connection drop in some of this conversation, but somehow I think we're all just used to that. It's 2020. <laughs> Anyway, uh, don't forget to stick around at the end of the conversation to hear this week's tip on how to reduce your plastic footprint from our friend Air at Five Gyres. And if you have a tip for us, some really cool creative way that you're avoiding plastic, uh, send it to us. Record a voicemail, a voice memo uh, with your best tip for going plastic free. Email it to us at oneocean at wcellpure.org and maybe we'll feature it in next week's episode. All right, here's my chat with Duration. Duray, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, it's it's a pleasure to catch up. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Reese. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I don't like to do too much of a bio for people. I really like people to introduce themselves. So quickly for people who don't know you or know your work, uh, you know, what's what's your background? What's your story? And, and who are you and where you're calling in from? Yeah, so I'm a millennial environmental activist. I currently live on Oahu um, in Hawaii, and I'm originally from the Philadelphia area in Pennsylvania. And I came out here when I was 18 and began to dedicate my uh, academic work as well as my activism um, in sustainability. So have a lot of experience um, in my professional life, just doing a lot of education and outreach and events around sustainability, primarily around reducing plastic pollution. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, from from your background, you've been engaged in this for a long time. Um, it, it looks like as soon as you set foot in Hawaii that you kind of set to work on styrofoam. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I don't know too much of the background other than you just went after styrofoam on campus and then it led to a bit of a win early on for your kind of plastic fighting career. Yeah, well, when I came to Hawaii, I was, I'm from Pennsylvania where environmentalism is not very prevalent. You don't really learn about it in school. Um, so when I came out here, I, I became like a very strong environmentalist just immediately because I was surrounded by nature. My classes were bringing it up on um, the severity of the climate crisis, especially here in Hawaii, where we're in the tropics and we're far more vulnerable to climate change than a lot of other places. So I decided to, you know, give back to nature because I was getting so much from it living here. And when I was walking around the UH Manoa campus, University of Hawaii campus, um, I was just seeing a lot of plastic, more than I would have expected for a place like this, where you there is a deep connection to nature. So it felt like this paradox. And the thing that was worst for me, you know, visually was styrofoam. You know, it's very lightweight. It blows out of trash cans. It was kind of like blowing all over campus and all over the city. So, you know, since then, my, one of my mentors had told me that Hawaii um, was the highest per capita user of styrofoam in the whole country wow. um, as a state. So because we and have why a lot of is like, that? we have a, like a lot like a lot of lower income business owners here like mom and pa shops and um the, you know ev they're always trying to make every um penny count because of because of their background but you know also, I started the food industry is the margins are super slim so like every you know my I grew up in the restaurant business and I know those margins are really slim so you got to do everything you can so yeah, they're trying to make a business, whether it's a food truck or whatever, then, you know, it's kind of understandable, but it, it sounds like that's a source of the problem. Yeah. And Hawaii has like really high rent, really high labor. So it's just, it's tough for businesses. And I think there's also a lack of understanding of why styrofoam and other plastics are so bad because we are so removed from places like California that have already moved in that direction. So um, I set out to find my environmental community out here with that mindset that I wanted to do something about styrofoam. And I found the guys who are running the Surfrider UH club at the time, because Surfrider has a big youth club network. Um, 
found them. Their first meeting was at a bar. We have a, we had a bar on campus and they were just like drinking and they were like, <laughs> let's do a beach cleanup. And I was like, yeah, we, we should definitely do a beach cleanup. But this is my first meeting. I'm like, why don't we also try to ban styrofoam? I don't know. Like, it's just... <laughs> you and went right like, for oh. it. I love it. They're like, what's your name? Who are you? Um, and they're like, oh, sure, let's try. So we just started to like put ourselves out there, we created a petition connected with some um, more experienced activists in the community, many of whom are like still my mentors today. And um, yeah, so we within four months, um, just through some simple campaigning, we were able to get a policy drafted and passed um, by the campus administration. So back in April of 2013, styrofoam um, was banned from being used in food establishments across the campus. And, you know, UH Manoa is a flagship campus for the state of Hawaii. It's the largest public university. So it's a huge victory. That's amazing. I love it. What, what were, you know, quickly before we move on to other topics, what were some of the keys to success in that? I mean, coming into a new group, new on campus, you don't know these people. How did you go about, um, you know, getting your sort of get, getting the win? Um, was there a strategic sort of play of we know that we need to get this person or that we need to get the businesses on our side? Was there some insight there? Because a lot of the people who listen are people who are trying to, you know, help drive their community to be plastic free or to, you know, be, be a leader and, and make change. So I'm curious if there was an insight there that you might share. I mean, being the more seasoned activist I am now and realizing how hard it is to win a lot of the time, I realized that at that point, we were really lucky that there wasn't strong opposition from the businesses on campus and that we had a chancellor at the time that was beginning to prioritize sustainability very heavily in his administration. So we were able to put that pressure on and in the in an, in our online petition, we actually targeted the chancellor. So for every person who signed the, um, I think it was moveon.org or change.org petition, um, you know, th- uh, a thousand people or more he was getting an email in his inbox. So by the time we had confronted him in person at one of our campus talk story events, um, I stood up and asked the question at the Q&A and it was a sustainability themed um, town hall. And I said, hey, you know, we have this campaign. You might've seen your emails coming in. He's like, yes, I've been getting a lot of emails and we totally are in support of this. Put a policy on our desk and we'll, we'll try our best to work with you. And that was like all on video too. So um, I think we were just like lucky with the timing. We weren't the first ones to try it. We were just we, kind of everything lined up really well together and they were friendly to the idea. It's still really impressive though. You, even getting lucky with all that, you know, it still takes a lot to get it across across the line. Um, you know, there are any number of reasons that these things can be stalled or, you know, reasons to say no to stuff, right? Just being too busy or cost or whatever it is. So that's a, it's an amazing win early on in your career. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, what I love about it too is that, you know, you went from the individual of your experience as an individual quickly to a bigger upstream solution. Um, and I think that's interesting because, you know, a lot of the, the work that is done in the plastic space and, you know, being plastic free July, um, it's a, it's a time when we all kind of consider our individual roles and we all want to do something in our day to day lives, but then we know that the bigger wins are upstream. And so I don't know, maybe can you talk about the, the, the work from individual to upstream and bigger systemic change? Um, cause you, you so quickly went from, from that to this bigger thing. Uh, and I'm curious how that plays out in the other roles that you've had, like, or you with Kakua Hawaii or now uh, with Surfrider Foundation? I think a lot of environmentalists, and I, I saw a lot of my friends go through this while I was in school, where we're, we're taking all these environmental classes, climate change, and we're realizing like how bad the problem is. You know, like we're losing species at an extraordinary rate. You know, our, our rainforests are being lost. It's just the, you know, the severity of the problem is so large that I felt like, yes, I cannot use my plastic bags, which I, I will do. However, it just didn't feel like enough. And so I was, I think a lot of environmentalists go through this like personal crisis of like, how can I truly help in a way that will make me feel better about like this global crisis we're in. So for me, it was like the only thing I felt like made sense given what the data was showing us about climate change. Um, And I should give some credit to my parents who, um, you know, I was born into activism. So they were, Oh really? They were activists. Yeah, they were activists when they were my age before they had me and my sister in Philly and they were fighting for reunification of the Koreas, ending the Korean War, um, you know, closing the income inequality gap, 
And so I was exposed to that at an early age, seeing people currently my age when I was young, um, being activists on the streets, going to demonstrations. And so I think just seeing how people could impact on a level outside of just their personal lives was really awesome. That's, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's so interesting getting exposed to it because some people just, you know, you aren't exposed to it. You think about, you know, you come out of your world and if you live in a small town, that's kind of what you know. I think about uh, often kind of my world growing up in the family restaurant business is like, to me, that was what my future was going to be until I finally started to meet some other different people and understand what was possible out there. Um, so it's so cool that you were born into this sort of activism and kind of ran with it right away. Um, going back to like the, the bigger systemic change, I mean, what are some of the projects that you've been a part of in Hawaii uh, to, to get more systemic change for the environment, specifically on the issue of plastic um, going upstream? I mean, I know there's a lot of education campaigns. I know that we're all trying to work to skip straws and educate the local businesses. I know Surfrider has the Ocean Friendly Restaurants Program. That's kind of a level to take it up from the individual action to let's solve it at the, the root level. So what are a couple of those programs or, or um, recent stories that you've been a part of? Yeah, I would say like the biggest one is Bill 40. And we just the mayor just signed that back in um, December. And it now stands as the strongest plastic ban in the entire country. So it actually (laughs) celebrate that one every time. It's a great victory. It it is. And um, it impacts Oahu and it bans single use takeaway plastics for the whole island. Um, with with some exemptions, of course, but it, it targets it moved away from this idea that we need to do plastic bags, straws, one thing at a time and brought us to a place where we could be like, you know what, we need to be comprehensive. We can't just pretend like single use plastics are like a one material at a time issue. And let's just tackle this in one policy. So there's a lot of reasons why we were able to pass it, even though for 13 years, um, nothing was being able to be passed, even just smaller things like styrofoam bans. Um, So, you know, we're really grateful of how everything worked together and our community has really grown in a way, um, especially with our youth that just, stepped it up and really got organized and um, coalesced around this one issue despite all the all the noise from the industry about the sky is going to fall down and you know we're going to have food shortages and all this stuff so we were able to combat that successfully and, and pass that this December. We've had a couple people so one congrats um, but two we've had a couple people on the show who've been a part of this as well we had Raf from Sustainable Coastlines we had Natalie McKinney and Kakua um, we've talked to Kona. Um, so we've talked to a number of the crew over there who've been a part of this work. And one of the things that stuck out to me were, were the, the youth education programs uh, and and how those have been going on for years. Right. And how what that did was it created a wave of you know this youth movement who got really engaged. And, you know, you could say that it could have been new to some some kids and maybe they would have come into it and still supported Bill 40. But you could also argue that it was the 10 years of Kakua Hawaii doing education programs that led to an awakened, you know, sort of uh, a group of youth that then really got behind this and put it front and center to the politicians and said like, Hey, I'm your future voter or I'm voting next year. or I'm voting now, you know, like you need to listen to us. And I, I just, that just seems so powerful. Right. And how long these things take. I think sometimes it's like, Oh, overnight, this amazing thing is the rest of the world or the mainland. Here's this story. But it's like, hang on. Like Ralph said, it was seven years working on this campaign. You know, that was a number that he cited, but I would argue that the effort started even before that, just by identifying the problem, educating the local public, educating the youth so that when you get to that critical point, you can then take advantage of it. Would you agree or disagree or, or, or uh, I don't know, any other insights from that experience? You know, I, I agree. There's been a, it's a, we're in a special moment. And, and I think there's like this Greta Thunberg event where youth are like feeling really empowered and feeling like their actions are really necessary right now. Um, and I also think that, you know, I, I have a different angle on this where it's kind of the more like, politics election side of it do tell because if you really look at yeah if you really look at what happened with bill 40 it was about this election that happened right before and there was this um city council seat that was um open and there was a long time council member in that seat who was traditionally very unfriendly to our ideas and efforts and he was very focused on business And he also wasn't the nicest politician in the world. He had a reputation for holding a grudge and being very petty. So then we had this new council member 
um, run against him and they had run against each other in the past and had continuously, one of them would win or lose by 20 votes or 40 votes. And it was just this contentious, wow. long battle between them. And so in this recent election, um, you know, the one that was supportive of our plastic issues had actually lost by, I think, 40 votes. And this was last year. And then um, they put, took it to court, I think, and they called for a special election. So everyone in that district had to pass the new ballot. So then they had this extra month or so to, to canvas their community. And all of these um, progressive groups began to rally around this new council member who was running for this other um, council member seat. And he ended up winning by a thousand votes. Wow. And he ended up being the champion, one of the two champions of our nine council members of this bill. And without him being put into the council and shifting the whole structure of the city council, because if he had lost, the other guy would have been the chair of the whole council, which means we wouldn't have even been able to do anything most likely. And so, while yes, all of this organization, this youth activism, all this stuff was important and impactful, um, it really goes back to civic engagement and elections and getting involved in your local elections because in Hawaii and many other smaller cities, you know, those, those elections get really close and there's a lot of people who don't vote. And if you just step up one day and take five minutes out of your day to do that, it can make a huge difference for all of us who are trying to do that institutional change work. I love the connection you're drawing here. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I think it's so easy to separate out. Like it, it's funny how certain issues in the environmental world become politicized. They shouldn't be because we all need a healthy planet, right? It should just be there's the science and then there's what are we going to do about it? But um, some issues become really politicized. Climate change is one of them, right? A lot of people are like, I don't want to hear that. I don't believe it. It becomes red and blue and all that stuff. Plastic somehow has managed to kind of not be politicized because it's like everyone can see that plastic up a turtle's nose or on their beach is a bad thing. They kind of like inherently get that and or the idea that it is now in our food or even in the air we're breathing through microfibers is like, oh, wait, that's that's bad. Like we all agree. So it's not this political issue. Um, that being said, you're highlighting the importance of having the right people who agree with that in office and in those local elections and the importance of those local elections. So it's kind of that, that it's, it's on all of us to be super vigilant and pay attention to those local elections and try to see, you know, who does represent your policies as best, uh, you know, to the best of their ability, who's going to be there and be your champion for the environmental policies in your local, um, city, state, and, you know, uh, and country. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I love that you drew that connection to it because it goes beyond now, you know, that's maybe the win for bill 40 on single use plastic. But then when you start talking about bigger issues, you know, whether, you know, in Hawaii, I know, um, you don't have like an industrial composting facility, right? So if you start to get into an issue like that, where that comes up and who do you, you have the right, the right elected officials around to make that happen. Um, or are there are other issues that you can think of where, you know, it's a very local issue that, uh, is in and around this. I don't, is it the Marine fisheries issue and the ghost nets and plat and the fishing nets or, or what, um, what is it for you that's next on the list, so to speak, leveraging that local, uh, political power? Yeah, I think there's um, the ind industrial composting thing is really huge. There's a lot of reasons why it's challenging in Hawaii and why we don't have it yet, while so many other cities do. So um, let's quickly but, back up. So industrial yeah. composting for the for the layperson is, you know, having the city manage a large scale composting system where you can have a compost you know, bin in your home where you can drop off on your curb, just like you do with your trash and recycling. Right. So we want to have and possibly even for those like um, for bioware. So any sort of like corn cups and, you know, biodegradable plastics, a lot of those, they don't just biodegrade in your backyard. They're only going to biodegrade in an industrial facility that can create enough heat. So that's why you right. need the right facilities in the right places. Uh, um, I know that that's been a challenge in Hawaii. Yeah. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of, reasons why it's challenging here, but we've been able to make a lot of progress on that because we have, you know, have had the time to like work on the politicians and the government officials here. Um, and they've explained to us why it's hard and we've, we've built relationships with them. And so um, that's definitely a huge next goal for, for our coalition of zero waste activists here in Hawaii is to, um, whether it's industrial or small scale to provide accessible food waste composting for every resident and business on the island and, and across the state. 
That's awesome. Um, you, you touched on something there that I want to um, tease out as well. You mentioned uh, just the relationships that you build. And it sounds like a lot of this stuff does happen over the long term, right? Building a relationship, being in a place, getting to know the constituents, their policy, their, their kind of their standpoint. And so to me, you know, I, I think um, what I've seen is like the wins that are happening in many communities or from environmental groups are happening in places where there is a strong community where there is a long-standing leader or several leaders who are there to you know understand the relationships and work on the different things and like kind of make that happen and so the takeaway from my standpoint is it's that kind of community grassroots engagement right one you as a uh you know stakeholder in your local community join your local group whatever that group is whether it's a surf rider or a water keeper or any sort of group Join that groups that you're engaged, but then two, by donating and supporting to these groups, you enable these groups to then have people like you who can do your job and make it your full time job, not just, you know, volunteering. Um, I don't know. Does that does that resonate with you? Because it's like one thing that I just continue to see again and again is that you need someone to have that stable position to go out and do this role. Um, it, it leads to more success. Yeah, so what a lot of people in the community who aren't going to be like what I do, like, which is, you know, heavy duty activism, we're in the community, we're super involved, you know, I think for those people, it's like, yeah, volunteer for your local organization, if you have the time, if you have extra funds, you know, donate what, whatever you can, if you can, um, you know, start sharing things on your social media, if you have a reach. So think about the ways in which you have power, and use that to, to help the movements and the organizations that you resonate with most. So whatever we can all do to amplify one another, I think that's going to be the most powerful thing. For sure. Um, those are great tips. One of the stories that I think, you know, we've seen a lot of amplification around coming out of Hawaii uh, and still resonating in the plastic space is around, um, you know, fishing nets and mm -hmm. that while the single use plastics that people are using, of course, are a big part of the challenge a lot of what uh, you're dealing with over there are it's derelict fishing gear and fishing nets, correct? I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to know unless you really live here and see it, but um, unlike a lot of other places where what you see on the beaches is just land-based debris, like, you know, food wrappers and takeout containers, um, in Hawaii, you know, on the east side of the island, everything we're seeing there, you know, except what is littered, which is very rare, people don't really litter nowadays. Um, you know, it's marine debris, and it's, it's all nearly all from the commercial fishing industry. So, you know, between our experts that do beach cleanups on a regular basis, it's been estimated to be 90, 90 to 99%. Wow. Um, of what we get on, you know, on that side of the island. And is that so, by weight or volume or, you know, quantity? You know, all of the above. Yeah. I, I assume it's weight because it's heavier, weight. but um, yeah. Wow. So it's these huge fishing nets, it's buoys, it's fishing crates, you know, oyster spacers, eel traps, hackfish traps. So if, if, for those who have been out here, you know what that's like, you know, the dirtiest beach on this island and every other island is a, a marine debris filled beach and they're usually remote. So they're not even ones that we're, we're going to, they're like closed off to, to public recreation. Um, and so for, for a lot of folks here, we've come to the uncomfortable realization that despite straws being a more sexy thing to talk about and like you can show the turtle video and it's very emotional and very popular and you get these trending hashtags it's it's commercial fishing gear you know that we're seeing here on a regular basis um and the volume you know that's where it's coming from and so if you want the equivalent action to that problem um it's reducing demand on commercial seafood and fish and you know a lot of people in the environmental community in hawaii in the surf community they love to eat fish and they love to eat cheap fish and commercially harvested fish from big box stores or, you know, get their local poke here. Um, but unfortunately, it's not sustainable. And you're supporting these industries that not only support um, this mass dumping um, and unsustainable practices, but also overfishing and, and the loss of the loss of our ocean ecosystem and um, the health of the the health of the um, whole you know, wild community in the ocean that's being lost because of, of, of um, overfishing and bycatch and all of that. So 
to me, commercial fishing is, is a largely overlooked issue. And I think it's because it's hard to talk about. People like to eat fish and um, it's hard to solve because it's in the yeah. ocean. So it's not a local policy we can pass. It's really got to come from the consumers first this time around. And so um, that's just something we, we like to talk about a little bit more than a lot of other environmental organizations haven't gotten to a place where they feel um, comfortable talking about that quite yet. Yeah, it's it's really challenging. I mean, you know, I, I tend to agree that we overconsume fish and we overconsume, uh, you know, commercial fish. Whereas, you know, if you are if you are consuming fish that you're catching, if you're if you're Kimmy Swimmy and you're out there catching fish on your own, um, you know, you're you're the most sustainable living, one of the most sustainable living people, right? Getting your protein right. source, but the ocean is important for providing protein to you know some billion people on the planet, and it is a more sustainable way to. It's more sustainable than beef or than chicken. Um, I wouldn't right. say that it is a hundred that it is it sustain inherently sustainable. Uh, it's just more sustainable than. Um, I think, you know, our food choices are super important so that we have to figure out a way that we can live in harmony and consume from the ocean in a way that um, we can carry on for generations. Right. And that's probably going to mean, you know, eating less of it, eating lower on the food chain. Don't eat big pelagic beauties like tuna, but maybe you're eating some oysters and mussels and some smaller fish that can replenish more quickly, stuff like that, I, I would guess. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, within the fishing industry is there a way to create net collection programs and to put penalties on releasing, you know, fishing gear and all that sort of stuff so that these nets aren't out there causing, you know, issues with wildlife, um, tearing up coral reefs as they drag along the bottom. These ghost nets can be really gnarly. I love what, um, the Boreo guys are doing, uh, to take back those fishing nets in Chile. They found a very sustainable source of plastic that would otherwise be out in the ocean and they're paying the fishermen to bring it back to shore. Um, they would sometimes otherwise burn it or just cut it free. And so now they bring it back to shore, they get paid for it. And those guys can turn that plastic back into a product. Um, right. we were talking about food there for a second and I want to touch on, I know that you, uh, have another kind of movement. Um, and it's the good food movement. So do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of my work in these, um, kind of, you know, I, I've worked for influential nonprofit organizations in the environmental movement here in Hawaii. And yeah, none of them were quite at the place where they wanted to talk about food choice. And I was like, yeah, I really feel like this is so important. And when I discovered how important it was, I made the jump. I'm like, I'm going vegan. And I was vegetarian already. And I was 19 at the time when I made that decision. And, and I also began to realize like how important organic was, how amazing right. our local farmers markets were ask, you know, talking to those food producers and being like, what do you, do you spray on your food? And I became really empowered and um, enthusiastic about this whole movement around food choice, because, you know, despite what I talked about institutional change with plastic, food choice actually has such a huge impact. You know, food choice and travel are probably the only two totally. actions that I would recommend you focus on. Not, I wouldn't even say waste is that big of a part of it because of just the carbon footprint of food and transportation. So, yeah, I began, began to get a little frustrated. I'm like, you know, I don't know why no one wants to talk about this. It's just like so important. You have all these followers. Like, let's just be realistic. Let's offer plant-based food at our events. It'll be awesome. Um, but because, you know, people weren't quite ready for that and every institution I had worked for, um, I started an organization called the Good Food Movement, me and my best friends. Um, and we just started to put together inspiring and fun events, inspire people to make good food choices that promote sustainability and health. Um, so we've had several film screenings that had 100 to 200 people in attendance at venues all across the island. Um, a lot of great food documentaries promoting plant-based eating, like Game Changers. Um, and, you know, our recent event was a vegan chocolate party where we had like 200 Ooh. people come out and we just had a DJ and all these chocolate vendors. We had this like mushroom chocolate guy who had all these like adaptogenic chocolates and, you know, um, all these desserts and these vegan food vendors. And it was just like a big party. Everyone's high on chocolate and we just like dance. And, <laughs> um, and you know, we just showed like you can have tons of food and chocolate and um, still eat plant-based and just really promoting the abundance of it, that there's not this sacrifice, that there's this been this myth and this kind of in cultural inside joke that vegans only eat salad. So <laughs> I always like to make the joke, like as a eight year vegan, I, I barely ever eat salads. I eat tons of decadent foods. Um, so that was kind of the purpose of Good Food Movement. And so that's kind of my passion project I do on the side. I love it. I love it. You're staying busy. Um, and you also surf, you also get out in the water once in a while. Yeah. 
yeah, I try to surf um, ideally every day whenever I can. You're in the place for it. All right. Well, this is this is a great uh, final question then. So um, if you could take this is our final question. This comes from Ace Bucken. Uh, if you could take one person surfing, who would you take with you? Where would you go? And what would you talk about? Any person in the world. This is your chance to, you know, is it a hero? Is it someone you want to learn from? <laughs> or is it a family member who you just haven't seen in a long time? Who's it going to be? What? My, my first thought was Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I should Cone, someone. I Kona should said that. Kony said Bernie as well. Oh, <laughs> that makes me happy. I love Kona. Um, yeah, I love Bernie Sanders. That was my first thought. But I feel like um, AOC would be more likely to say yes. So I'll take AOC <laughs> out with me. And we can uh, bring What would you talk about? It. I think just how to take over the political system, you know, remove all the corruption and BS and really turn it, turn our government into what it is for, which was for the people, by the people, the people, um, and and saving our planet. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Make no small plans then. Where would you take her surfing? Um, I would probably take it to Waikiki because that's just a nice thing to do for a beginner surfer. So over what if she surfs? Do, Maybe she surfs and we don't know. Then we'll go to bowls. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Dre, anything else you want to share with our listeners before we uh, say goodbye? Just I'm super grateful that WSL um, has this pure WSL pure to really promote sustainability. And it's been awesome to see all the amazing ways you guys have gotten involved globally um, and, and focusing so much in Hawaii, which is really important to me because I feel like Hawaii is this hub, global hub in the middle of the world, um, in the middle of the ocean. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful for the future of our planet. And I think people like you and organizations um, like yours are, are critical to, to maintaining that optimism. So thank you for your work. Oh, thanks. I'd say the same. I mean, every time I've come over there, it's been super welcoming and warm and, and all sorts of great people doing great work. So I'm just trying to help um, help support you guys and do our part here. Um, keep up the amazing work. It is really inspiring. Um, you know what what the community is doing there to you know protect that coastline and those waterways is, is really fantastic. So uh, we're here to help. We're stoked for you rooting from the mainland. And uh, thanks again for spending some time with us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Reese. Duration is making no small plans, and I am here for it. Maybe there is a run for office in her future. I don't know, but if I could vote for her, I would right now. Um, all right, thanks again, DeRay, for joining and for all the knowledge and the work that you do to reduce plastic pollution and protect the ocean in general. Thanks to our friend Eric Copeland, exec director of Five Gyres, dropped us a voice memo on how to go plastic free. Stick around at the end to listen to it. Most importantly, thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. If you like this episode, please be sure to throw us a rating or a review. It really helps us out. And uh, check the show notes. All the links to DeRay and her work are going to be in the show notes. And if you're not already, be sure to subscribe to our WCL Pure monthly newsletter. We tell you what the latest is with WCL Pure, but more importantly, we try to curate all the different ocean news that we used to put in this podcast into our email newsletter. So it'll keep you up to speed on ocean and environmental news. Um, That's it. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, stay compassionate, stay six feet away, stay active, stay positive, stay plastic free, and stay stoked. And uh, that's all I got. Here's our friend Eric Copeland of Five Gyres with a plastic free chili. Oh, plastic free July tip for you. All right. See you next week. Hey, hey, this is Eric Copeland, the executive director of Five Gyres, calling in from my home in Los Angeles. And uh, my best tip for reducing plastic pollution is to stop ordering takeout food uh, so much and instead try to make more of your food at home. Do you like that? Well, if so, subscribe over there and then watch more videos over there. And then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.